This is Ray Mossolder, and we're back to Mark Goodwin's <laughs> just an amazing book called The Economic Collapse Chronicles. We're in the second of three books, and right now I'm going to read Proverbs 16, 18. Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. Now, because we don't use that word haughty, when was the last time you said it? Haughty. I'm going to reread that with just a little clarification. Pride goes before destruction, and a bragging spirit before a fall. Secretary of Defense Hale and President Howe we're meeting with the Joint Chiefs Saturday morning to finalize the plans of, for the action being taken against Pastor John Robinson's compound on the following morning. One of Scott Hale's staff members burst through the door. Mr. Secretary, I'm, I'm so sorry to interrupt, but the soldiers being held in detention at the camp outside of Biloxi are taking over the camp as we speak. Scott Hale looked at President Howe without speaking. President Howe said, scramble jets out of Kessler and light the camp up. Make a surgical strike and eliminate all life forms within a half mile of the camp. This is war, Scott. Don't look at me to do your job. You can't make these decisions on your own. You need to step down. There are plenty of men in this room that can do your job if you can't. Yes, Mr. President, Hale said. He'd just been embarrassed in front of all the Joint Chiefs. This president was a tyrant. Maybe the coalition was right. But Scott Hale was not the type of person to rock the boat, particularly when he was in it. You heard the president scramble the jets, Hale said to his staff member who was still standing there. The men reconvened their meeting. Gentlemen, I think we need to eliminate this threat. All of the soldiers presently being held around the country are deserters and guilty of treason against the United States. I feel I've been too soft on these traitors. The punishment for treason is death. I have a soft heart for these men and women because of their prior service to our country. But the reality is that we don't have the resources to dedicate to guarding them and caring for their nutritional and medical needs. I feel the humane thing is to put them down. How paused. There was a look of shock among the Joint Chiefs at his recommendation to exterminate the prisoners. After Scott Hale's reprimand for not being more proactive in his brutality, they didn't question him. How raised his voice. Anyone who's not on board with the federal states is free to hand in their resignation and leave. It was obvious to the Joint Chiefs what that meant. If they resigned now, they would likely not make it out of the room alive. They all muttered somewhat in unison, oh, no, no, Mr. President, we are with you, Mr. President. Uh-huh. Very well. Since we're all in agreement, you gentlemen come up with a plan to carry out the mission. I think we should postpone the attack on Pastor John Robinson's compound till after we put our own house in order. One week should be plenty of time for that to be handled. Scott, you should coordinate with Jared Campbell 
to make sure this gets to the media in the right light. Don't make us look like monsters. How walked out of the room. Scott Hale took the reins and started off with his suggestions. What type of chemicals can we use in the food supply or water supply to get rid of the prisoners? The vice chairman spoke up. Well, if we use the weaponized virus, we can eliminate them all through the food supply. The downside is that all of the guards will be eradicated along with the prisoners. The upside is that we could say the food supply came from the coalition. The chief of the National Guard Bureau spoke next. That could work to our advantage. The casualties among the guards would be proof that we didn't initiate the biological attack. We could simply say it was fate that caused us to distribute the food among the prison camps first. We'll claim the reaction time was such that we were able to destroy the con contaminated food supplies prior to it being fed to our troops. I like it, Scott Hale said. Be around. See what the rumor mill is spitting out about our other bases that may be considering siding with the coalition. We could send them contaminated supplies as well. That would make the story more credible and eliminate potential future threats. The proverbial two birds with one stone. Hale and the others finalized their plans to infect the prison camps. Chapter 28 We are persuaded that good Christians will always be good citizens and that where righteousness prevails among individuals the nation will be great and happy. Thus, while just government protects all in their religious rights, true religion affords the government its surest support. Who said that? George Washington. Matt said to Adam, Venison steaks and baked potatoes, what a feast! The potatoes were the last ones remaining from the previous fall. There would be no more till this spring's crop came in. A couple of men from the militia, Eddie Cooper and Franklin Johnson, attended the same church as the Bears. They came over to Adams for lunch Sunday afternoon. Matt's phone rang. He got better reception at Adams than on his own farm. He wasn't sure where the cell tower was, but it must have been closer. It was his friend Frank in St. Augustine. Hey Frank, still no word from my buddy Jack. They got here just a couple of hours ago. Boy, they don't look good. Wow. Two weeks to go 300 miles. Jack said they got robbed at a roadblock in the West Palm Beach. The bandits took everything they had, then beat the heck out of them. He says they just beat them for the fun of it. They're both very dehydrated and malnourished. They wouldn't have made it much further. Jack has a really bad infection on his arm from the attack. The girl isn't talking. She looks catonic. Matt shook his head. Oh, that's rough. I guess they're blessed to be alive. Did they get any other clothes or anything? Nothing. The only thing they arrived with were the clothes on their backs and the things they scavenged on the way here. They had a shopping cart he picked up in Vero Beach was full of every kind of thing you could imagine. They had cardboard they used for making a bed. 
trash bags tied together to make a shelter, plastic bottles to get drinking water from creeks and streams. I don't think they were purifying the water. We got them eating some soup and drinking hot tea. It's in the 60s here, but they're cold because they didn't have the right clothing. Well, we're going to try to get them to clean up after they eat. I can't tell you how bad they smell. Angie is taking a collection from the rest of the group for clothes and personal items. When they get back to normal, I'll dig up that little cache we buried last fall when you came through here. Oh, man, I forgot all about that. You still have those buried? When Matt and Karen had left South Florida, they head to Kentucky last fall. Matt was robbed at a rest station while filling up the gas tank with gas cans from his trailer. As soon as his assailants showed their weapons, Matt drew his Glock and shot them. In his panic, he picked up the bandit's guns and threw them in the trailer. He then went to Frank's to lay low for a while. Frank buried the guns in case anyone came around to ask questions. Matt killed the two men in self-defense, but the stuff had just hit the fan and he had no intention of getting caught up in an investigation. I'll give that Beretta to Jack. He only has one magazine, but it beats the heck out of the broken broom handle he's been carrying for a weapon. We have plenty of 9mm ammo for him. The girl comes around. What's her name again? Tina. Tina. Now, if Tina comes around, I'll give her the 357. No one has the ammo for it, but still has the six rounds it had when you brought it here. After what they've been through, the guns will make them feel safer. I don't know how to thank you, Frank. You came through for me again. Everything I have belongs to the Lord. If he sends someone in need by me, I have to do what I can to help out. Besides, you supplied the guns. Yeah, don't remind me. Matt didn't like to remember the event. Brother, you did what you had to do. It was them or you, Frank reassured him. I still feel bad about it. Matt fought what he had done with what he had done. You wouldn't be human if you didn't. I'll give you a call in a couple of odd days and let you know how they're doing. Matt came back into the room and gave Karen an abbreviated version of what had happened. She didn't say anything. A single tear fell from her eye. She had not been very close with Tina, but they had been neighbors for several years. Wesley and Shelley listened in as Matt told the tale of Jack and Tina's ordeal. It was shocking how far downhill things had slid. Everyone except the kids crammed into Adam's study to listen to Paul Randall's internet address. They brought a few extra chairs and a couple of people sat on cushions on the floor. Franklin Johnson had a notepad to take notes. As commander of the Eastern Kentucky Liberty Militia, he was using ham radio to coordinate with militia and military units in other coalition states. This internet address was his only method to get direct communication from the commander-in-chief himself. Paul Randall began his address. America, 
We've just received intelligence reports that a severe outbreak of the deadly disease has swept through the prison camps in the federal states. President Howe had granted amnesty to any U.S. troops who wished to leave bases located in federal states. Those who took him up on that offer were detained in prison camps, and we now believe they're being executed with a biological weapon. We think it may be a weaponized version of Ebola. Intercepted radio communications indicated severe flu-like symptoms running rampant in the camps. The typical incubation period for Ebola could be up to two weeks, but we believe these prisoners were infected in the last 24 hours. This would indicate a genetically modified strain of the virus. It leads us to believe that the soldiers were infected on purpose. There have already been several deaths reported. The federal states have quarantined the infected camps, allowing no one in or out. It's obvious that Howe has ratcheted up his savagery. We must be ready. No atrocity is below him if he is willing to do this to his own soldiers. Adam got up and left the room. Janice followed him. Nat looked at Wesley. Is he okay? Well, he had a couple of buddies that were supposed to leave Quantico during the amnesty period, Wesley told him somberly. Everyone else remained in the office and turned their attention back to Paul Randall's address as he continued. While we are deeply hurt over the loss of lives of those brave men and women, we will not be drawn into an offensive position. With that said, we will defend the coalition states to the last gun, the last bullet, and the last man. We've drawn our line in the sand, and we will surrender no further liberties. All those in the federal states who wish to keep their liberties are free to join us here in the coalition states. On a more upbeat topic, all federal agencies have been evicted from the coalition states. Likewise, the employees of those agencies that didn't see fit to resign from those agencies but decided to remain loyal to this criminal regime occupying Washington, D.C., were also thrown out of the coalition states. As of today, any federal employee or agent attempting to enforce any taxing authority or federal law within the coalition will be shot on sight, the same as any other traitor. Therefore, it goes without saying, there will be no banned firearm collection at any federal agency anywhere else in a coalition state. This is my last plea for liberty-loving patriots outside the wire to join us here. Your future is certain bondage and unimaginable tyranny if you stay where you are. I know how many of you hope to fight and win freedom for your states as well. But without state-level leadership and military support in your state, your struggle will be extremely difficult. I realize it's hard to walk away from your homes and all you've worked for, but it may be stripped from your hands by Anthony Howe anyway. 
I ask for your prayers, patriots, and know that I will be praying for all of you in return. God bless and God speed. Wesley was the first to come in on the speech. Yahoo! No more IRS. Eddie Cooper was right there with Wes for a high five. Shelley asked, won't the coalition start their own IRS? Matt said, they'll have taxes, but I don't expect it to be anything that resembles the IRS. Paul Randall was running on dismantling the IRS slowly over time. I suppose the present situation just sort of fast-tracked that objective for the coalition. The conversation quickly turned to what the government would look like in the coalition. Matt loved the subject, but he excused himself to go check on Adam. He found Adam and Janice sitting quietly on the front porch swing. The sun was just setting and the air was turning cold. You gonna be okay, big guy? Adam had a solemn expression on his face. Well, I'm just thinking about all those American heroes that survived countless firefights and attacks overseas only to be murdered by their own president. Matt said, especially your buddies at Quantico, especially them. Their death won't be in vain. It'll strengthen the resolve of this Marine to fight like I've never fought before. I don't mean to brag, but I arranged many meetings between Allah and his jihadists when I was in the sandbox. I'm good at what I do, Matt. Even during militia training, Matt had never really seen the killer inside Adam before. When he looked into Adam's eyes, he made his vow. Matt saw it, and it spooked him just a bit. Chapter 29 George Washington said, If we desire to avoid insult, we must be able to repel it. If we desire to secure peace, one of the most powerful instruments of our rising prosperity, it must be known that we are at all times ready for war. Pastor John Robinson had just walked to the pulpit Sunday morning when Albert Rust ran to the stage. The security protocols had been put in place weeks ago, so there was no need to get permission from Pastor John before Albert began his announcement. Folks, I want everyone to take a deep breath and remain calm. But we have to dismiss church right now. Our observation on State Road 55 has reported several armored personnel carriers headed this way. We think an attack on Youngfield is imminent. Militia, you know your positions for an attack from the south. Everyone who's assigned to the north, east, and west borders holds your positions till we call you to the southern border. We don't know if we're going to get hit from multiple directions. Ladies, you know where you're supposed to be hunkered down. Let's get there right away. The ladies who were responsible for the medical aid tent. Let's get everything set up just as if you have injured already coming in. Now, if it turns out to be nothing, it'll be a good drill. 
if the worst happens, you'll be ready to start saving lives. Pastor John stopped everyone. Before everyone runs out, I want to say a quick prayer. I know we have to hurry, but I feel the Holy Spirit is asking us to give God one minute, even though it goes against everything in our being. The congregation fought the urge to run out anyway, but they all stayed for Pastor John's quick prayer. Pastor John quickly bowed his head and began praying from the third psalm. But you are a shield around me, O Lord. You bestow glory on me and lift up my head. To the Lord I cry aloud, and he answers me from his holy hill. I lie down and sleep. I wake again because the Lord sustains me. I will not fear the tens of thousands drawn up against me on every side. Arise, O Lord, deliver me. O my God, strike all my enemies on the jaw. Break the teeth of the wicked. From the Lord comes deliverance. May your blessing be on your people. Amen. Now, go fight for your families. Fight for your liberty. Fight for your freedom to worship your God. The congregation's fear melted away with those few short words inspired by God's holy book. They were supernaturally charged with courage and faith as they took their battle stations. Albert Rust and several of the men were the first to arrive on the southern side of the young field. They saw hundreds of federal troops rolling out of their personal carriers quickly and orderly. The federal troops formed up into squads and began to take defensive battle positions. Several pickup trucks and a few more Humvees provided by the Idaho National Guard was still taking their defensive positions inside of Young Field as the commander of the federal troops called out to them from the other side of the fence. If you throw down your weapons and surrender, you will be given quarter. There's no reason to lose your lives today. We have you completely outnumbered, out-trained, and outgunned. You have five minutes to comply or your blood will be on your own head. Trey Dayton told the men near him on the line, don't listen to him. That's the same thing they told those soldiers that were infected with the Ebola virus. If we're going to die, let's die right here and die with dignity. Albert Russ looked at Will Pender and said, I'm going down the line and Give everyone a heads up. Wait two minutes and blow all the mines on the south side. The militia had fragmentation mines buried outside of the barbed wire fence. They were hardwired into four detonators, one for each side of the camp. Will Pender was holding the detonator for the south side in his hand. Albert started up the left side of the line to tell them to open fire after the detonation. He was trying to avoid using the walkies in case the federal troops were listening in on their frequency. He sent James McIntosh up the right side of the line with the same message. We looked back and forth from his watch to the detonator. The adrenaline coursing through his veins was making his hand shake. The seconds counted down slowly. 
It was 20 seconds before he was to line up the enemy line. The enemy was oblivious to the fact that they were sitting right on top of the mines. 10 seconds. We'll focus on the watch and the toggle switch. Five, four, three. Don't blow it! Will walk, Will's walkie screeched out. It was Albert Russ's voice. Will's shaking hand was on the toggle. The sound almost made him hit the switch. Don't blow the mines yet, Will. They're a bunch of soldiers surrendering to us. More than a hundred soldiers had thrown down their weapons and were walking quickly toward the militia's line. Bill Maxwell was right beside Albert Rust and Pastor John Robinson. Bill said, I think it's a trap. I think we should shoot. Pastor John said, let's put some men on them and see what they have to say. If it's a trap, we'll mow them down. Russ said, I agree, Pastor, but you should be in the shelter. These people need a spiritual leader. Robinson replied, God is their leader. If he sees fit to bring me home today, he'll raise up someone else to fill the gap. Albert Rust called over his walkie-talkies. If your last name begins with an S, escort the prisoners to the meeting barn. The federal commander shouted out over the loudspeaker, Open fire on the deserters! Kill the deserters! Federal troops that hadn't walked off the line seemed confused by the number of their fellow soldiers who were walking away and hesitated to follow the command they were given. I said fire! The loudspeaker rang out. The commander ran up to the line and began firing with his sidearm. The men walking off the line began to run towards Young's field. The commander hit the soldier beside him and screamed, Fire! The trooper began to fire trooper began to fire on the deserters. Soon the entire federal line was shooting. Many of the federal deserters began to fall. Many more reached the safety of Youngfield line. Hold your fire! Albert Russ said over the radio. They moved the two Humvees and propped up the bottom strand of barbed wire to make a space for the defectors under. Once they were all inside or, or shot down, Albert Russ called to Will Pender on the walkie. Blow the mines, Will! Will immediately complied. He hit the main toggle switch, which was labored, which was labeled Fire All. The militia watched as thirty separate mines blew up. Four armored vehicles flipped over. One flipped up in the air and fell right on a fire squad of Federal soldiers. The Federal commander was three feet away from one of the mines when it blew. He was blown to pieces. The explosions caught the Federal troops completely off guard. Hundreds were killed or injured beyond being able to continue to fight. Fire it well, Russ called over the radio. The militia began cutting down the Federal troops as they spun around in confusion. Many of those not killed or severely injured by the blast were temporarily deafened or blinded by the explosions. All of them were confused and disoriented.
by the quantity and quality of the eruptions, but that didn't last long. The federal troops began to organize and return fire. One soldier fired a javelin missile into one of the Humvees being used as a shield for the militia in Young Field. The Humvee exploded and killed several men in the vicinity. Five more javelins were fired into the militia's line, killing many more. Albert Rust called to the two Bradleys positioned in the tree line. They were manned with Idaho National Guardsmen who had been given strict instructions not to fire on federal troops unless Young Field was fired upon. Bradley Alva, Bradley Bravo, I think this qualifies under your rules of engagement. We could use a little support. All Rust heard back over the radio was, Roger! Seconds later, the 25 millimeter shells from the Bradleys began tearing through the armored vehicles of the Federal troops. Once again, the Federal troops were caught off guard. Hundreds more were cut down in the crossfire of the Bradleys and the militia. The militia's line wasn't unscathed. Their dead were piling up. Others were injured and some were unable to continue in the battle. Pastor John took his rifle and stole away to the meeting barn where the defectors were being held. He grabbed one of the defectors and asked, Why do you men cross over? The man replied, Well, a bunch of us decided to leave the federal states after we heard about the prison camps. They told us it was the coalition that had sent in the contaminated food, but we knew better. This was the only hope we had of defecting. We were just hoping you all wouldn't shoot us. Will you fight with us? We'd be honored to, sir, the soldier replied. Pastor John called out, Militia defectors, follow me. We need, need every man on the line. Defectors, take off your shirts bearing U.S. insignia so we don't have any friendly fire issues. You'll find rifles on the ground by the fallen militia. Just grab one. Start firing. If you can't find one, I'll try to get some sidearms from some of the men. That will at last make, at least make some noise. Let's go. They all returned to the line. Albert Russ called out to the northern border. North border, if your last name ends with a letter B between A and R, we need you on the south border. We're taking casualties, east and west. If your last name ends in A through L, we need you on the southern line. Everyone else holds your position. The six men from the observation post were just arriving from the two-mile hike on foot since they spotted the vehicles approaching Young Field. They arrived directly behind the Federal troops. They took up positions in the tree line at an angle so their stray bullets wouldn't end up hitting the militia instead. Inside the, they, that, let me read that again. They took up positions in the tree line at an angle so their stray bullets wouldn't end up hitting the militia inside the camp. They were able to take sniper shots without being noticed as the Bradleys were making so much noise. Soon became obvious that the Federal troops weren't going to win the day. The man who stepped into command after the original commanding officer was killed 
called out over his radio, Cease fire! The few remaining Federal troops laid down their weapons. They were rounded up by the militia. The prisoners were held under heavy guard. They would be transported to an Idaho National Guard facility the following day. Chapter 30 Samuel Adams said, and by the way, that's not just a beer. That was a president of the United States. I hope you knew that. Chapter 30 He who is void of virtuous attachments in private life is or very soon will be void of all regard for his country. There is seldom an instance of a man guilty of betraying his country who hadn't before lost the feeling of moral obligations in his private connections. Anthony Howe poured a bit of whiskey into his coffee. He'd never been a morning drinker, but then again, it never had such a shocking defeat as the one in Idaho yesterday. The phone rang and rang, but he didn't pick it up. Finally, his chief of staff came into his study. Sir, Alec Renzi began, we missed you at the briefing morning. I'm sick, Alec. Renzi inquired, would you like me to have the physician come take a look at you? Uh, I drank myself to sleep last night, Alec. Howe answered matter-of-factly. No one else needs to know about that, so no, I don't want to see the doctor. Mustafa al Mohammed is on the phone for you, sir. He's been calling all morning. He insists that you speak with him. Give me five minutes and I'll call him back. I'll let him know, Mr. President. Renzi let himself out of the room. Howe's staff cleared out when he was like this. He put the coffee down and took a gulp of straight whiskey instead. He felt his stomach flip and the saliva began to flow into his mouth. He fought back the vomit and breathed. Howe poured himself a glass of whiskey and mixed it with a bit of water to cut the strength so he could get it down without getting sick. He took out his cell and called El Mohammed. The former president answered on the first thing, first ring. Anthony, what are you doing? If it gets out that you had these troops exposed to the Ebola virus, they'll have you beheaded. What happened in Idaho yesterday? You took your first military action against the Sunday school class, and you lost? Al Mama's voice got louder with each question. How finally lost control. Shut up, Mustafa! The liquor kicked in just in time for him to let it rip. You're not going to control me by hanging that video recording over my head anymore. Do you think the country cares that I had a couple of underage hookers in Brazil when the economy is tanking? I control all of the mainstream media. If they run that story, I'll have the FCC pull their license. Do you think Jenna will care? She's along for the ride. I'll call her right now and tell her myself. Al Muhammad was silent. He may have assumed he had how on a leash, but evidently he didn't. Mustafa said, I'm sorry you won't take my counsel, Anthony. I only wanted to help. I'm afraid you're going to find out that you're not the emperor sooner than you think. How shot back. What is that supposed to mean? Al-Muhammad 
said, Ask your father. Then he hung up. I finished his whiskey and water, then called Scott Hale. The Secretary of Defense was there within 15 minutes. Mr. President, I'm very sorry about the way things turned out yesterday, Hale said as he walked in. He looked nervous. He continued to explain himself without being asked. We sent a thousand men in there. We didn't get the intelligence that they had Bradley fighting vehicles and we had no way of knowing that over 100 of our men would walk off the line, sir. They had mines buried right underneath the positions that our troops took. It was just really bad luck. Any one of those things we could have worked around. But altogether, sir, it was more than we were prepared for. You're forgiven, Scott. Do you want a drink? You look a little shook up. No, sir, I'm fine. I insist I'm having a drink. Don't make me drink alone, Scott. If you insist, sir. Good, President responded. He poured them both a neat shot of whiskey. Neat? May I have a little ice? Scott Hale asked. Get it yourself. I'm not your waiter. Hale dropped the subject of ice and drank the whiskey neat. Scott, I think there may be a conspiracy inside Mount Weather to eliminate me. I think Paul Randall has people inside of the Secret Service. Now I need to get out of here. And I need a Black Ops team for my security detail. I don't know who in the Secret Service is conspiring with Randall. If Hale thought the President was drunk or perhaps delusional, he didn't voice his concerns. He didn't oppose him in any way. I can have a team together by tomorrow morning, Mr. President. Scott said, Get a team together to move me by tonight. Just me. Jenna can stay here. No one needs to know about this but you. I'll handle my communications through you and you alone. Can I trust you with this? Yes, Mr. President, the Defense Secretary conceded. Chapter 31 Thomas Paine said, Not all the treasures of the world, so far as I believe, could have induced me to support an offensive war, for I think it murder. But if a thief breaks into my house, burns and destroys my property, and kills or threatens to kill me, or those that are in it, and to bind me in all cases whatsoever to his absolute will, am I to suffer it? Paul Randall was focused on the mission at hand. He joined Larry Jacobs, Sonny Foster, and Alan Jefferson in Larry Jacobs' large study early Tuesday morning. After the assault on Pastor John Robinson's compound in Idaho, all the leadership within the coalition states pushed for strict border security. Randall and the others were meeting to come up with a standardized protocol to secure the borders of the coalition. I want to try to have a balanced approach to this, Paul Randall stated. I wish there were a way to let the patriots who had been dragging their feet into coalition states 
Well, we have to have a hard borders, Jefferson replied. We can't risk a repeat of the Idaho incident. If you insist on not launching a counter strike, the borders are going to be our battleground. We have to have an asset and troop build up all along the borders. We need air patrols. The Northwest is especially going to have to utilize air patrols. There's no way they have the manpower or equipment to cover the borders. We have no way of getting more ground assets up there. How's no fly zone and massive troop buildup in Utah, Nevada, and southern Colorado have cut them off from Texas? Texas Governor Jacobs suggested, can we have hard borders and still check in patriots looking to relocate? What is the vetting process, Larry? I don't know. Ask for their voter registration card. There were a couple of lighthearted chuckles at that suggestion. Jefferson objected. Being a registered Republican is a poor litmus test for being a patriot. Well, that's true. But being a Democrat is a sure sign of being an enemy of the Constitution. Point taken, Randall said. We don't really have the resources to open up the states for people who are wishing to be uninvolved and enjoy freedom in the coalition without sacrifice. I recommend that we require a period of military service from anyone who wants to come in from an outside state. That will deter freeloaders who think we're going to have a better economy. Are you going to require women to serve on the battlefield, Paul? Not on the battlefield, but there are other cap capacities. Randall was adamant about this. We're going to need support personnel and lots of nurses. If Idaho was any indicator, this is going to be a bloody contest. Well, we still have no means of weeding out spies, Paul Randall responded. We have no means of weeding out spies that are already here. We don't know which soldiers could still be loyal to D.C. Who could have stayed behind with the intentions of trying to disrupt our efforts? I think the best form of deterrent against such actions are coarse punishments. Sonny Foster spoke up. Harsh punishments will no doubt reduce spying and treason, sir. But if you are viewed as being too rough, the Patriots may think of you as a dictator. Paul said quiet for a moment, then said, That's a good point, Sonny. How do we deal with that issue? Sonny answered, You could put it to a vote. Let the people decide the punishment for spying and treason. I mean, who knows? They may come up with a worse method of dispatching the enemy than you would have. Then they can say nothing about cruelty. Larry Jacobs said, That's a fantastic idea, Sonny. What would you say to letting each state have its own form of punishment? Well, if it were up to me, I would require each state to come up with their own punishment. State sovereignty is one of the main issues in our movement. Each state should be responsible for coming up with their own laws. I don't want to overstep my boundaries as I'm not a leader in the capacity of the rest of you gentlemen. Paul Randall said, 
You're here because I value your opinion, Sonny. You have become a very trusted advisor to me personally. You've never overstepped your boundaries in all the years I've known you. Please continue. Well, in that case, perhaps should, we should be wary of stepping into the role of the federal government. Unfortunately, I think the entire process of federalism has become deeply ingrained in our way of doing government. Our present conflict will tempt us to strive toward a strong leadership role among the coalition states. I don't think we want to become a scaled down version of Washington, D.C. Would be far better to start out on the right foot, working towards a constitutional republic made up of sovereign states. Sonny, I can't thank you enough for that reminder of who we are and what we're fighting for. Of course, we have a common enemy, and it will serve us all well to have a strong military strategy for all the states to combine their efforts. Ellen Jefferson said, You're a man of wisdom, Sonny. Paul is very blessed to have had your counsel over the past few years. We're all fortunate to have you advising us. I'll formalize my military recommendations, send them around to all the states. They can ratify as is or modify them to the specific state's needs. Larry stated, Texas will adopt your recommendations as soon as they're formalized. We should start the initial buildups on the borders within the hour. Paul Randall added, I'll put together a recommendation for the states to begin drafting their individual punishments for treason and spying. The only guidance I'll give is that they should be sufficiently harsh to effectively deter such activities. The men concluded their meeting to begin their individual tasks, and we do the same thing. We're done for today, but I'll be back tomorrow. I want to thank you for praying for my hands. They're working strongly now. Keep the prayers going.